This is The Secret Life of Language, a podcast from the University of Melbourne's School of Languages and Linguistics. I'm Charlotte Mackay. And I'm Peter Hurst. At the time of European settlement in 1788, more than 250 Australian Indigenous languages were spoken. Fast forward to 2019, and only 13 Indigenous languages continue to be acquired by children. Another 100 or so languages are still spoken to varying degrees by older people, but are at risk as elders pass away. Murinpata is one of those 13 languages, and it is not just being actively passed on to subsequent generations, but it's also gaining new speakers. In this episode of The Secret Life of Language, we introduce you to the life and language of the Murinpata people. I'm Dr Barbara Kelly. I'm a developmental linguist who works in the School of Languages and Linguistics and the Research Unit for Indigenous Languages. My name's John Mansfield. I'm a professional linguist. I'm a lecturer in linguistics at the University of Melbourne and the language I research by far the most has been the Murumpata language of Northern Australia. Now, Bab, why are we researching this language? This language is an interesting language. It's one of the few traditional Australian languages that's still being learned by children as a first language. So it's still being transmitted across generations as it has been over centuries. We have these then secondary benefits we can get from it where we hope to be able to understand better about how the human brain processes language on how our processing of language may interact with the world around us and even cultural specificities of our world. So, Barb, let's get a sense of the physical and social environment in which this language is spoken. How many speakers of Murinpata would there be? Around 2,500 to 3,000. It has quite a large speaker population and the speaker population is interesting because it ranges from newborns to much older speakers. John, you were doing uh, fieldwork up north in Australia. So where was that and how did you become involved? My main field research I've done is in a town called Wadia, which is probably the largest remote Aboriginal community in Australia. It's got about 2,500 people, which is very large for a remote community. It's about five or six hours by road southwest from Darwin. And that road is fairly often cut off by wet seasons Quite often, you can only access Wadia by small plane. So it quite well lives up to this concept of a remote community. It's quite out there and far from the big city. I've been going to Wadia for just about 10 years now. So what languages do they speak there? Are you the only English speaker? I'm not the only English speaker. So I said about 2,500 people. It's not like I was the only white fellow who'd ever wandered into town. There's maybe two or 300 non-Aboriginal people who work there. Murimpata is the main language of the town, but actually there are about five or six other Aboriginal languages from the immediate area, the speakers of whom all kind of came in and settled the same town. These are languages like Maringar, Marishevan, some Jamanjung speakers, Mariamo, Magatike. Now I feel like I should name them all, not to leave anyone out, but <laughs> that, that's, that's got most of the main ones. Because Murunpata is the dominant language in the Wadaya region, the Northern Territory government puts out public service messages in Murunpata, like the one you're about to hear, advising people to be crockwise in and around waterways. Australian Indigenous cultures are well known in academic circles at least as having very complex and nuanced sort of familial structures. Now this is part of the way they interact with each other, but it's also encoded in language. So I asked John to tell us more about that. So people's understanding of the world and their place in the world and their approach to interacting with each other is very much shaped by the kinship relations they have. And these kinship relations are not of the same pattern as we might be familiar with, you know, your father, your mother, your uncle, your aunt, your brother, your cousin. There's sort of a different set of kinship categories. There's, I would say, rather more different categories you need to differentiate from a Murumpata person. And it's a kind of different system. Some notable differences are the fact that 
you have a lot more people who you would call brother or sister. So anyone who is my father's brother's sons, I will call brother. Anyone who's my father's brother's daughters, I will call sister. And then on my mother's side, you're going to get the same kind of pattern flipped around. And then this runs through multiple generations, through like my father's father's brothers, son, sons, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's like this kind of iterative pattern running out through your kin connections, which defines how you should call that person, because you very often not call the person by their name, but instead call them brother, cousin, whatever kind of what the mudan pata terms are for that. And it can also influence how you interact with them, like degree of eye contact, whether you can give or receive things from them, whether you can drink from the same cup. Peter spoke to John about key features of the Morin Pata language and compared these with English. John also touched on aspects of the English language that native speakers take for granted, but that are difficult for learners coming from other languages. Let's get a few examples of how Morin Pata differs from English. So let's just start off with the basics. It's been claimed that it's a free word order language. First of all, what does that mean? Mm. And is that claim true? What does it mean, Pete? That's a good question. So the idea is that some languages have a fairly fixed order of words, and it's fixed in the sense that you need to get the right word order to get the meaning right. So we can see an example of this in English with the difference between the cat chased the dog or the dog chased the cat, whereby these have different meanings, right? That's obvious to us all. But the only thing showing that difference of meaning is the different order of the words. Now, as an English speaker, this may seem completely natural to you, but there are lots of other languages out there where there's no system like that. The words may be quite flexible in how you order them, and also that reordering of words may not be used to indicate the difference in meaning. So you could have another language where you say the dog, the cat, chased in whatever order, and you use, say, different inflections on the words that tell you which one was doing the chasing and which one was being chased. Murampata is somewhat more like this latter type. People seem to show actually quite a lot of flexibility in how they order the words. So yeah, it's fairly different from English in that respect. Okay, so the nouns get little endings or something on them, do they? Well, in Murampata, they do sometimes use these, what we call case suffixes or case inflection in linguistics. And Murumpata does use a bit of this to sometimes indicate which person or thing is doing the chasing and which has been chased. But actually in Murumpata, they don't use the case inflections much either. It's often actually just left unspecified in the sentence which one is doing the chasing and which one is being chased. So you just need to infer it from the context. Now, you were talking earlier about all the complex stuff that you add to the verb. Mm. Can you ever use that to work out who's doing what to whom? Uh, To some extent. So the verb has many different kind of inflectional markers on it in Murampata. And some of these indicate the number and gender of the actors who are involved in the activity. So there can be one marker that will tell you the person who's kind of doing it, and it will indicate whether they're first, second or third person, whether they're singular or plural, whether they're male or female in some cases. One of the most distinctive features of Murunpata is its use of very long sentence-like verbs. Peter explored this further with John. All right, so we've looked at uh, word order and how Murunpata uses a sort of special markings on the nouns and special markings on the verb to sort of show who's doing what to whom. Mm. But otherwise, it's quite flexible. Mm. What are some of the other really big differences between, say, Murunpata and English? So Murunpata verb can end up being this very long word that puts together multiple parts into this kind of long string. So you can have a single verb like menaninta no maratarara. That means they were going along taking turns. Uh, That's an example from my friend Raphael. And uh, maybe you could have an example like pumampungu taninta uran. means back on this uh, chasing verb again. That would be if two of them are chasing a few of them. So these verbs I've just pronounced, they have kind of five, six, seven different parts all strung together. They might have one part telling you that there was two of them being chased and one part telling you that there was a few of them doing the chasing. And then there's one part telling you that they were moving along as it happened and another part telling you that it's present tense. So you get these five, six, maybe seven or more bits all stuck together. 
And this is one of the reasons why I speculate that Murampata may be more difficult to learn than other languages. And there's this concept or a term, uh, polysynthesis or polysynthetic that people use for languages like this, which basically just means languages where you can have one word, usually a verb, with all these different bits stuck together. But in some ways, when we research and dig more into this concept, it just ends up begging the question, what is a word anyway? Because these these enormous verbs in Murampata in some ways aren't much like the standard concept of a word that we have in English because they are like these almost whole sentences, but they're just kind of squashed together in some way. You kind of have to say it all together as a unit. You can't really break it up in the same way as an English sentence. And do other languages do this or is it just Murampata? It turns out actually large numbers of languages around the world have these kinds of systems. Uh, across northern Australia, there are probably at least a dozen or so languages like this. It's just right through much of North America. Caucasus comes to mind as another area. There's really particular areas of the world where it's really just often the kind of common way that languages work. There's a little bit of research by our colleague Rebecca Dufina on that in languages that stick verbs together. And I think she has shown that there's some science that the sticking of verbs together may involve people thinking of those two things as being a single event. But these are still just little bits of research and there's still a lot that's unknown about this kind of question. So when we look at the way that children learn languages like English or Japanese, these well-studied languages, we see that kids start with simple sentences, maybe with only a single word. So, for example, a kid might say something like push and just gesture to the people that are involved in that interaction. The situation is really different for these polysynthetic languages. So these languages have single words, just like in, say, English or Japanese, but very often you can't actually pronounce them. It would be like a kid trying to say push in one of these languages, be like a kid trying just saying ing in English. We know it means something, but you're just not allowed to say it by itself. So it's a real mystery at the moment as to how children acquire these kind of languages because it's very hard to break them down into just simple parts. So now that we've got a taste of the complexity of the modern part of language, we're going to find out more about how children actually learn it. Now, Bob, your research interest lies predominantly in the manner in which children acquire modern pata as a first language, contrasting this, for example, against children who learn English as a first language in Australia. What are some of the differences that we see between these two groups of children? So one of the primary differences that we see is that in Murumpata, the verbs are very long and they're very complex. And so children learning Murumpata can't rely on the same sorts of rules that children learning English might rely on. So in English, for example, children can generally rely on a rule that if it's past tense, I can put ed on the end of a verb. In Murumpata, that's not the case. So children need to learn really high numbers of different verb forms, and then they have to sort of rely on analogies and patterns for acquiring the forms that they need in their everyday talk. Does this have impacts further along down the educational line? Is this seen in a different way of thinking, critical thinking, when compared to non-Indigenous Australian students and specifically uh, non-Murinpata speaking Australian students? That's a really interesting question. It's not something that we've looked at and it's not something that I know of as being different. But what I can say is that for children who are learning Murumpata, although the verbs are very, very different and the way that the language works is very, very different, there are similarities that we see between children learning Murumpata and the way that they construct their language and children who are learning languages like English. And so one example would be uh, that children learning Murumpata seem to learn sort of general all-purpose verbs first before moving on to specific verbs. And so all-purpose verbs might be things that have a general meaning like put or make or do. And these are similar to the types of verbs that we see young English learners learning first. Whether that has some sort of outcome in terms of later language development or educative development is yet to be seen. What do the differences 
in terms of how children acquire a first language in the Australian Aboriginal and more precisely more in Pata uh, context and the broader community, what do these differences tell us about first language acquisition in general? So they tell us a few things, but I think the primary thing is that when children are learning a first language, it's not something that's built into the child. They don't come with an a priori language system. It's something that emerges over time. And so we see children learning Murumpata in the same way that children learning English or Sherpa or any other language build with a basis of building blocks that over time become more and more complex. And so it develops over time with more and more input. We also have shown and have have seen that Murumpata caregivers who are speaking to young children modify their speech to children so that it becomes more and more complex over time as well. And so we see sort of this concomitant development over time with children as well. Some psycholinguists have theorised that the human brain possesses a special language acquisition faculty. We investigate if the research into Murumpata language can shed light on these theories. Bob, Noam Chomsky, a rather famous linguist, early on in his career postulated that humans have this specific language acquisition device. What does studying children who are acquiring Murunpata as a first language tell us about this kind of hypothesis? Yeah, this is one of the sort of primary debates in the area of first language acquisition about whether or not children are born with this language acquisition device. And Studying a language like Murumpata tells us that children who are learning very, very different languages learn them in similar ways. But it's not because there's a language acquisition device that they're learning them in similar ways. We see that children learning Murumpata, as with children learning English, begin learning language in similar sorts of ways in terms of less complexity in their early language, both in their comprehension and particularly in their production, and the emergence of more complex language over time. And that relates to the type of input that they get and what sort of things emerge over time as they mature. So, Barb, does this actually discount the idea of a language acquisition device? What sort of process would be functioning in its place? On the basis of what children are hearing in their um, everyday interactions with adults and older speakers of the language, they're getting models of how to use the language. And they begin to use the language on the basis of what they're hearing and what they're able to produce in terms of their processing at different ages. When we think about a language acquisition device, one of the things that is important and very sort of timely, really, is the fact that a lot of our theory in first language acquisition, particularly theory that has been built around this idea of a language acquisition device, is based on major world languages, in particular based on English. And so if we look at the field of first language acquisition, we see that our building blocks for the field, our theoretical models for the field, are based on 1% to 2% of the world's languages, so 70 to 80 of the world's languages, which means that we're not taking into account lots and lots of very different kinds of languages, potentially, such as Murumpata. Barb, we mentioned in the introduction that Australia has lost hundreds of its Indigenous languages since white settlement. Is Murunpata a threatened language? It's an endangered language, but within an Australian context, it's a strong language because there are young learners, children learning it as their first language. But certainly at the moment, it's a really strong, thriving language. Children are learning it. They can do everything in Murunpata that any other child can do in any other language. We've heard a lot about how Indigenous languages are under threat, how few are still spoken today. Mm. And yet, 
it's really heartening to hear that so many children are learning Munpata as their first language. Why do you think it's different? Why is this language so strong in this community and in other ones less so? I think it comes down to the convergence of multiple peoples. Each of those languages probably had a relatively small speaker population. But in this case, you've kind of got this conglomeration of six or seven language groups who've all uh, end up converging on one language. And so unfortunately, that's been to the loss of these other languages. But then the good side of it is you end up with one strong language, Murumpata, which now even extends beyond Waria. So then the kind of ironic later flip side to this is you now get Murumpata spoken in other areas that are not Murumpata country. And that's because Murumpata built up so much kind of gravity via this unusually large remote community of Waria that it's now even spoken in other towns in the area that aren't on Murumpata country. The influx of other language speakers into the Wadia area has implications for speakers of minority languages and for Murunpata speakers. Do Murunpata speakers also speak other Indigenous Australian languages? So many speakers of Murunpata also speak other languages from the surrounding area in general, both in the town, in Wadia, Um, but also in surrounding places as well. So it's quite a multilingual area. Absolutely. All of Indigenous Australia is multilingual. I asked John how easy or difficult it is for speakers of minority languages to learn Murunpata, in particular people who are coming into the community. John, you said earlier that Murunpata is being spoken more and more widely. I think it's fair to say that it is easier to learn a different language the more it's closely related to yours. I spent a little bit of time in Germany lately, and the speed at which I can learn German is just incomparable to the slowness with which my modern path of learning has gone. And that's, you know, undoubtedly because German's pretty similar to English in a lot of ways. So very often when languages come into contact, that promotes change in language. Mm. Has modern path changed? Oh, yeah, it's absolutely undergoing changes, as every language does. So there can be a kind of conceptual confusion where language change can be seen as unusual and some kind of force of corruption and something going wrong and, you know, often to with the youth ruining things. The true perspective is that all languages are changing all the time. So Murumpata is having contact with this Creole. It's a kind of English-based Aboriginal language that's right across northern Australia but quite different from English. It's got so much influences from Aboriginal pronunciation and grammar. And as an English speaker, you generally wouldn't be able to understand Creole. But it gets around a lot. And a lot of Murumpata speakers have contact with Creole. They also have contact with the English language through the uh, non-Indigenous people working in their community or through trips they take elsewhere or maybe through media that they're consuming. So there's all these contacts going on with English and Creole. And This is reflected in the younger generation's use of Murumpata. They borrow lots of English and Creole words. So they're still speaking Murumpata grammar. The sentences are still very much Murumpata and the pronunciation is still very much Murumpata, but there's lots of borrowing of words from English and Creole. And often in the way these are borrowed, they change their meanings. So an example from a little story I recorded was they use the word sniper, but the word sniper didn't mean a person shooting from a roof or something. They used the word sniper to mean sneaking up on someone. And I think this changing of meanings is in some way facilitated because, as I mentioned, English isn't very strong among Aboriginal people in Wadia. So a lot of these guys, they don't actually speak English fluently or speak it on a day-to-day basis. So that means these words can kind of filter into their own local language but then change their meanings very easily. How do Murunpata speakers feel about changes to their language? And what are the attitudes towards that kind of language change in the community? I've talked to some young people who are actually rather proud of it and say, you know, we've got our own we've got our own way of speaking Murunpata, isn't it? Great. Mixing is very often seen as some kind of form of corruption. So Older people sometimes grumble about it a bit, but I think perhaps not too seriously. I think even the older people maybe you know, they're happy that young people are still speaking Murumpata in general, even though they may grumble a bit about the mixing in these English words. And interestingly, alongside this, 
the vocabulary, the traditional Murumpata vocabulary, it's so rich and elaborate. And I think it actually requires possibly some educational effort and planning for this to be passed on to the younger generations. Because the other grumble we get from older people is that the young people don't know all the old words still. But I know they're aware of this at the school and trying to look at ways they can try and keep, keep the old words alive. John caught up with Mungbere Tanmak Jeremiah, a native Murumpata speaker for a short interview. He asked Jeremiah whether the children were still learning Murumpata and if he thought the kids would still continue speaking it in the future. Do children in Waria speak Murumpata too? Always they talk Murumpata in Waria. And how about at school? Do they teach in Murumpata or English? They're learning about Murumpata too. Do you think people will keep speaking Murumpata in the future? Always they're going to talk Murumpata in the future. The Secret Life of Language is a podcast from the University of Melbourne School of Languages and Linguistics. Producers for this episode are Kelvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel from Profactual, Gavin Neighbour, Peter Hurst and me, Charlotte Mackay. Recorded and mixed at the Hallwood Studio by Gavin Neighbour, licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2020, the University of Melbourne. I'm Peter Hurst. And I'm Charlotte Mackay. To Take Us Out is a song in Maroon Pata by Mark and Kevin. The link for the song will be provided in the show notes. Thanks for listening. I'm gonna put that guy in a kiddo